Hi there. Now if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I love the Yu-Gi-Oh franchise. Always have. First being introduced to the game via the original anime that ran almost daily on Nickelodeon, my young impressional mind was hooked the moment I experienced Kaiba's defeat at the hands of Exodia for the very first time. This love quickly transcended to the TCG itself. Vivid memories of heading to the corner shop with my friends to buy my very first pack of the Legend of Blue Eyes will be forever engraved into my childhood. I got nothing special from the pack itself, but just the overall experience is the thing I look fondly back on. Similar memories come to mind when I first got my hands on the original Yu-Gi-Oh! and Kyber starter decks after a trip to Toys R Us. The design of the cards were just iconic even for the time, and it's no wonder Yu-Gi-Oh was as big of a success as it turned out to be. However, despite all of this, my actual experience with the TCG is extremely limited, partly due to the fact no local events ever existed where I lived, coming from a small town in Manchester. Also, growing up, I didn't have the money to buy cards aside from the occasional pack from time to time, and even when I did have enough cards to form a deck, the best we could hope for was a few playground duels with friends, consisting of really slow and unoptimised decks, littered with our favourite cards and the Lord of D. Thanks to this, my only means of experiencing Yu-Gi-Oh as in the game were through the plethora of video games released throughout the early 2000s. Now this was a special time for Konami in my eyes. Not only were they actually releasing good games, or games at all for that matter, this also marks an era where they proved to be extremely experimental with Yu-Gi-Oh as a brand. Yeah, there were games based off the actual TCG for the original series, such as the World Championship games for the GBA and the Dawn of Destiny release for the original Xbox, but for the most part, the full extent of the series' game library consisted of games that had little or nothing to do with the actual card game itself, Konami plastering the IP onto anything they could with mixed results to say the least. Some of these games were absolute bangers, and whilst others, well, downright sucks ass. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories kinda falls in the middle, whilst having little to do with the actual TCG, it has a good reason for that. Forbidden Memories actually predates the card game by a few years, so any references the developers had when creating this game pretty much span from the manga, and it shows. But with that out of the way, let's get into why I love Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. So before we head into discussing the actual game, here's a fun bit of trivia to clear up a pretty common misconception I always hear, and I have no idea where this originally stemmed from. No, contrary to popular belief, decks aren't determined by the name of your save file, it's completely random. Again, I have no idea where this even stems from, as I always used to see references on game facts as a kid, stating putting something like Konami in your name guarantees you a good deck. It doesn't. My best guess is due to this game's sequel, Duelist of the Roses, implementing a feature where your name does somewhat determine the list of decks you can choose from. Aside from that though, I have absolutely no clue. So the story begins with the Poundland Jafar of this game, Hai Shin, finding some sort of treasure? He serves as the main antagonist of the game, well, kinda. We'll get into him later on when he reappears, but as of right now, this is all you're really left with. What I find interesting though, not just about Forbidden Memories, but the other Yu-Gi-Oh games in general from this time frame, is that Konami had a habit of reusing these original characters and reworking them into part of the other games and the ongoings of those stories. Hai Shin doesn't just make an appearance in this game specifically, but many of the other installments too, albeit in different roles. It just makes the Yu-Gi-Oh games from this time period feel interconnected, even if they had nothing to do with each other conceptually, and I like that. Anyway, the premise for the story is a simple one. You take control of Princess Hem during his life in ancient Egypt. It's clear that they took heavy inspiration from the manga and can be considered an alternate retelling of the Shadow RPG arc, except it's pretty good and not as lackluster as it was in the anime. Before you can really do anything though, you're stopped by your Ten's guardian, Shimon Muran, and scored for sneaking out at night. This simple introduction showcases beautifully the freedom the story offers you on repeat playthroughs, as the choices you make actually influence your experience to some degree. I'll get into that in a little bit, however for now, Fuck this guy, let's just run away and have some fun. So, what does the future heir of an entire dynasty do in his spare time, you ask? 
Sneak out at night and play a children's card game with the local peasants, of course. It's here at the dueling grounds where we're introduced to our Thames closest friends. Not Mana, sadly. Tiana, because everybody has to have an ancient Egyptian counterpart in this game, apparently. And the local plebs, villager 1, 2, and 3. Oh, how bold their parents had to have been to give them names like that. And after we flex on these toss pots with our cyber soldiers and our glass of courage, Tiana drags our kingship to the town plaza, where a ceremony is taking place. This is where you're introduced to a Thames' other best friend, Jono. Why is Joey here too? And the clearly obvious antagonistic mage priest, Seto. I absolutely adore this scene by the way. Even in his past life, Joey can't catch a break from this man. But after Jono got his ass absolutely kicked in by the just as big of a prick Seto, we proceed to do the same to our poor best friend whilst we wait for the priest to show his face at the duel ground. Once he does show up, the first confrontation between Natem and Seto begins, sporting an utter banger of a duel theme by the way. Whilst I'm on the subject of the music, the soundtrack found in Forbidden Memories is varied in its composition, from more atmospherical pieces usually thrown throughout the myriad of cutscenes, to the high energy pieces heard throughout the gameplay. Each song is tied to a specific location, plot point or character depending on where you currently find yourself, which was a great way to go about it as it makes the constant dueling far less repetitive to play through. So here's a few of my personal favourites. It doesn't take us too long to send preset or packing, lamenting he will meet us again after recognising our fine princely ass. And we go home elated, ready to gloat to our parents about our dueling prowess, only for Shimon to send us to our room without supper. Do you really have to be that harsh, Shimon? So you remember Jafar from earlier? Yeah? Well he's back and he's currently invading the palace. Well that escalated quickly. To provide context as to what the hell's going on, Haishin is a high mage with an ancestry of sorcery, and using his status within the region as a ploy, he searched until he found the treasures of his ancestors, a map containing the locations of the Millennium items. Now with the Millennium Rod in hand, that looks nothing like the Millennium Rod, and another five already in his possession, Haishin breached the palace in search of the Millennium Puzzle to finally achieve his goal of world domination. Shimon tries to stop him, and he's gone. 
After hearing the commotion from his room, Atem is guided by another servant in the most half assed escape attempt I think I've ever seen in my life. And of course, she is captured by the mages led by none other than Seto himself. He really wasn't kidding about meeting again, was he? Anyway, Seto essentially forces Atem to stay while he questions him on the location of the puzzle, using the king and queen's lives as bargaining chips. Obviously, we know nothing about the puzzle, so it's all good. Until Shimon appears out of nowhere with the Millennium Puzzle in hand. Mate, why are you bringing it straight to him? Run! Flee! Nobody would suspect you had it! Shimon handing Atem the puzzle orders him to flee so Haishin is unable to achieve his goals, only for Poundland Shafar to barge in and corner the young prince. With no other choice, Shimon instructs Atem to duel Aishin, and this shouldn't be too bad, right? I mean, we beat Seto, we slapped all the commoners, he should be no diff- Oh, right. Well, that went well. Yeah, this is the only duel in the game where you have to actually lose in order to progress. Usually, if you lose, you're forced back to your prior save through an arbitrary game over screen, but this loss actually advances the story. If you somehow defeat Haishin here, you'll be forced into another duel. Good fucking luck with that, though. With him having access to some of the most powerful monsters in the game, the only chance you have of winning is if the AI majorly fucks up, which it has a tendency to do, to be honest. With no other options left, well, Shimon had an option, all he had to do was fucking run. He uses the remainder of his strength to grapple Hai Shin, which... How is he even struggling here? Shimon looks exhausted and beaten down, just use the rod! Anyway, with Hai Shin occupied, Shimon pleads with Aten to shout the puzzle, sealing his soul within it, deeming it the only way to save both the prince and the puzzle. He believes that somebody would be destined to reassemble the puzzle one day, allowing the prince to return to the world of the living. Huh. I wonder who that could be. A quick side note, like when Shimon does this, what happens to a Ten's body? Couldn't Haishi just kill him off or you know, pick up the puzzle pieces? I know I'm reading far too much into it, it's just, I need to know man. At this point, I think it's time to go over what makes Forbidden Memories so different in its gameplay. As I mentioned in the beginning, Forbidden Memories actually predates the TCG, and from my research, aka a look on the Forbidden Memories Wikipedia page, the rules used were the prototype rulings they had at the time. However, personally, it reminds me a hell of a lot of the cluster fuckery of the Duelist Kingdom arc. To highlight these similarities, the core of Yu-Gi-Oh remains somewhat intact here. You each start off with 8,000 life points with the goal of depleting your opponents. At the start of every turn, you draw cards, which you can inevitably run out of and lose fire deck out, whilst your deck itself runs a combination of specific monster cards, spells and traps to help aid you in overcoming each respective challenge. The fundamentals are there which gives credibility to the prototype rulings being used, however that's where the similarities end. Unlike the TCG, effects monsters are not a thing and neither are levels. I compared the mechanics of the Duelist Kingdom Arc for this reason. You can summon any monster you want at zero cost, with a small caveat to this. You can only play one card per turn, regardless of whether it's a monster, spell or trap. It's weird seeing as you can leave yourself completely open by setting a spell, but you can manipulate the tragic AI into doing the same thing so don't be discouraged not to do so. It can be useful in saving a Raigeki for when you have enough board presence. You can also set monsters in face down attack position, which can make the AI attack into it, leaving them in a worse position. When I was a kid, this is how we actually played the TCG back on the playground, as we were too stupid to actually read the rulebook. The two major differences, however, are through the mechanics exclusive to Forbidden Memories itself, those being the Guardian Stars and the Fusion Mechanic. First up is the Guardian Stars. Essentially, they are symbols that are assigned to every monster in the game. Each monster has up to two depending on a varied number of factors, such as their attribute, with ten Guardian Stars in total making up the weakness chain. If anything, this is simply a glorified game of rock, paper, scissors, or the alignment system from Dark Duel Stories. While some are pretty obvious, some beats Moon for example, the others you might want to write down as it can get convoluted pretty quick. If a monster with the right Guardian Star opposes a monster whose star is weak to their own, they will gain 500 attack points upon battle. This is a dynamic buff, not static, so they will return to their original attack points at the end of the battle, and you can determine whether your monster is weak to the opponents by the colour of the text displayed on the monster. If it turns red, their monster's Guardian Star is a strength to your own, and vice versa if the card is highlighted in yellow. Honestly, at the start, this doesn't really affect too much, as there's usually more than a 500 point difference between cards. You do want to learn the weakness chain as soon as possible though, as it will become extremely important by end game when the opposition have monsters with over 4000 attack. That 500 point buff truly makes a difference then. Now for the fusions. So I kinda lied when I said you can only play one card per turn. Technically, you can only set one card on the field every turn. In Forbidden Memories, you're able and actually encouraged to play multiple cards at once. So by pressing up on the D-pad when selecting your hand, a number prompt will appear. This represents the chain of which these cards will be removed from your hand. One being the first in the chain, and five being the card that ends up on the field. Yes, 
You can burn your entire hand on any turn, but it doesn't really matter as in Forbidden Memories you don't merely draw a single card on your draw phase. No, you continue to draw until you have 5 cards again. This makes decking out a valid concern, but you do need to do this in order to take advantage of the fusion system. By selecting the right combination of monsters in the chain, they're able to fuse to create a stronger beast, and this is quite extensive. Factors that can make or break a fusion can be determined by the monster's attribute, its type, and even its gender. That's quite impressive for a PS1 game. This is your gateway into accessing the stronger monster cards at your disposal by crafting a deck of specific weaker monsters to gain the result you want. Be careful though, as if there's another card later in the chain and it isn't compatible, the fusion will be overridden and you're pretty much screwed. But this is also the way you can equip your monsters with equip spells to increase their base attack. Now whilst the fusion system is quite extensive, none of it really matters because of one fusion specifically, the Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, or THTD for short. What makes THTD so great lies with a number of factors, the first of which being its assessment ability for how strong of a fusion it is overall. To fuse the THTD all you need are two dragons and a thunder, or vice versa. Attributes and types that are easily accessible as drops from the starting duelists of the campaign, such as Jono and the villagers. Having a 2800 point beast that can you can form a deck around too early on, when the strongest monsters you'll come across range around the 2000 mark as the AI rarely fuses is a godsend, and will pretty much guarantee an easy road to the end game. If that was all THT had to offer, then maybe you could make a case for the fusion system not being unbalanced. But there's a whole lot more my friends. Above its atrocious accessibility, this fusion also succeeds in the versatility department as well, being compatible with nearly all the important quit spells in the game, bumping its attack to the 5k range if you have the right setup in the deck, as well as having its attack boosted by not one, but two field spells available, Mountain and Umi. Unless you hate yourself, you're going to want to run this strategy in your deck, it's just too good not to abuse. If there is one card that can contest with a THCD, that would be the Meteor Black Dragon, or MBD for short. This card is a 3500 behemoth and you can have up to 6 of them in your deck, free for obtaining as a standalone card as a drop rate from both Journal 2 and more commonly the Low Meadow Mage, but also as a fusion by fusing Meteor Dragon and Red Eyes Black Dragon, both cards you can obtain as drop rates from Beast in Journal 2. Similarly to the THCD, MBD is compatible with a ton of equip spells and by already having a much higher base attack from the offset, makes this card a must have for any given deck. I think if the opponents in the later half had a more varied monster pool than simply having the most powerful monsters in the game, most of which are unattainable for you by the way, the fusion system will be better suited to experimentation. But when you're forced to face down three fucking blue eyes ultimate dragons or a gate guardian, mystical sand ain't gonna cut you chief. Now with that out of the way, back to the story. So after the absolute fail of an escape attempt with the Millennium Puzzle, a tense spirit and body has remained trapped within the Millennium Puzzle for 3000 years, where we meet Yugi Moto as he and Joey Wheeler compete in Seto Kaiba's brand new tournament, the Yu-Gi-Oh World Championships. Shouldn't... shouldn't it be called Dual Monsters here? No? Okay, moving on. As none of this is really important, this essentially comes down to a list of encounters split into two rounds, the preliminaries and the finals. The former comes down to Yugi dueling the likes of Rex, Weevil, Bandit Keith and My Valentine, all of which are piss easy if you have the THCD. Even if you didn't though, as long as you have a somewhat competent grasp on the fusion system, these plebs will prove no trouble for you. The story takes a turn with the appearance of Shadow, bringing up the trapped spirit within the puzzle and allowing Yugi to look inside his own mind with the Millennium Key to contact the prince. This is Yugi's first and only interaction with Atem in this game. There's no friendship, no lovers, no bromance. Atem literally gives Yugi six blank cards with no explanation and fucks off. It makes sense given this only serves as a plot device to send the prince back home to his time, but I kinda dig it. After this event, the finals take place where conveniently enough, every opponent going forward has a millennium item in their possession, and once Yugi defeats Shadow, his two items are drawn into the blank cards. Upon defeating Bakora, possessed by the spirit of the ring, Pegasus, Ishizu who looks really fucking evil in this game by the way, but she this much of a prick in the manga, and Kaiba who has the Millennium Rod for some reason, all the blank cards have absorbed the present day items, opening a door that allows Prince Atem to return home. Like I said, whilst he only interacts just the once, Forbidden Memories actually gives Yugi a degree of strength and independence we didn't really see from him in the manga until the final few chapters and the Dark Side of Dimension movie. Speaking of DSOD, the scene where Atem returns to save Yugi, ripped right from the this game, I mean look at it, it's almost uncanny. With Shimon parting his final words of wisdom onto us, we return home to the present. Well, ancient Egypt, whatever way you want to look at it, the Millennium Puzzle conveniently still intact. How nice! 
It's at this stage Egypt opens up somewhat, as you're able to traverse to other locations than just the main city. None of this really matters though, as you return to the old dueling grounds to see everything has been totaled by that prick I shin. Jono, who miraculously survived, I guess you can't kill cockroaches, escorts the handsome prince to their new dueling grounds, literally underground to hide from Jafar and the rest of the mages. They now know you're of royal blood, and they still have the audacity to challenge you to a duel. Jono has a red eyes now, but since he still hasn't grasped the basic concepts of fusion, THTD makes quick work of him. Tiana and the village can also be redoed here but they don't really matter so moving on. With no sense of direction or clues to go off, Atem makes his way back home to see the palace absolutely annihilated and the state of Shimon's room ain't much better either. The mage guarding the ruins challenges us to a duel for trespassing. Like bitch, you're the one that's trespassing. It's our house! Regardless, a few THTD summons and we end his life. I think. It's sort of implied, but he could have also run away like a bitch. I wouldn't put it past the dude. After searching Shimon's room, we come across a map of some sorts, which leads us to the Valley of the Kings and this absolute arsehole Sadin. Sadin, I presume, is a relative to Shadi, since Shadi is from this area to begin with. But anyway, he's the guardian of the Valley of the Kings, and he breaks the news to you that Poundland Jafar not only killed the Ten's parents, but refused to allow the corpses to rest in the Valley of the Kings. A final fuck you to the loving couple. He then has the audacity, the absolute balls to claim that he stopped Haishin from entering the valley, which is bullshit setting. That map we got from Shimon's room leads to the Forbidden Valley, a hidden portion of the King's Valley where the ancient sorcerers buried their secrets, including the locations of the Millennium Items, the very same map Haishin discovers at the start of the game. What the hell were you doing then setting? This could have all been prevented if you just did your job in the first place. <sighs> so anyway, after this man lies straight to your face, he at least takes you to the location only to be stealthily followed by Seto. Somehow he just knows we are back in town, I guess? It's clear Seto has an ulterior motive, as he pretty much tells you Haishin's plan and where to find the Millennium Items. Each guided by Haishin's mages who protect them in their respective shrines, and to retake the items you have to defeat each of them before we can take out Haishin and save whatever's left of this nation. With our objective clear, we head out to take on the mages and none of them are really worth talking about. The story pretty much takes a back seat until after we've defeated them. And on that note, they shouldn't give you too much trouble. I mean, they can be fucking annoying as they get the home field advantage, because of course they do. But even then, you can just use a field spell of your own, which will force them to waste a turn reverting the terrain back, giving you a free direct attack. Easy stuff. Eh, uh, excuse me, since time immemorial? Bro, I've been gone a week. Haishin invaded the palace literally a week ago. Get the fuck out of here with these delusions of grandeur. I know guarding the items must be absolutely boring, but you aren't that important. Why does he have two shafts poking out of his head? Why does he look like that? Is it a hat? Does he have a skin condition only found in ancient Egypt? How does he get through the doorways? Is he stuck here now? Is that why he agreed to this? He can't exit the shrine? As I mentioned earlier, the one thing I love about the story is the freedom in the choices you can make. In some scenarios, your choices don't matter as you're forced to take on Aishin and you're forced to shatter the puzzle, or you'll be looped back to the previous dialogue until you choose the right option to advance the story. In every other situation though, it's entirely different, and I find this to be both great for returning players to experience the game in a new way, yet also detrimental to first timers. So after you've beaten two of the mages, there is a completely optional story out where Tiana is captured by Seto, and you must go to the vast shrine with Jono to save her. This event isn't really significant, and it doesn't change much if any of the story going forward. The only thing you'll miss out on is the Seto 2 duel, since you'll still have to take on the Labyrinth ruler in the end anyway if you don't do so here. But it's just the fact that something like this exists that blows my mind. I never knew this existed as a kid, and it bothered the fuck out of me why there was a space missing in free duel. I didn't have the internet back then, so the only way I would have encountered it would be by chance. And the game is full of this albeit not to such a high degree, spanning optional dialogue and cutscenes that you can very well miss, and I love that. It adds to the replayability by a large margin, just to discover every little secret hidden in plain sight. You remember the opening with Shimon? Well if you do what he says and head to your room, you skip the entire first half of the game. No meeting Jono or Tiana, the villagers or Seto, you are brought straight to the scene of Aishin invading the palace, leading you straight into the midpoint. I like this a lot as it makes the beginning overall a lot harder. The first few rounds of the tournament are piss easier to compensate, but unless you have a grasp on the fusion system and guardian stars, you won't be getting very far. This is where it becomes problematic for the first time player though, as the game never really addresses that something like this can happen, and for all you'd know, it's just a natural line of events. The only suspicion you'd have to go off would be the missing spaces in free duel, but even that isn't self explanatory. It could very well lead to a situation where a newcomer would have to reset, unless they were somehow lucky enough to get a decent deck and they're quick to pick up the mechanics, in order to consistently grind off the first few duelists in the tournament via free duel. Speaking of free duel, let's discuss how you actually obtain cards to upgrade your deck. Despite the story having a card shop, you can't actually buy cards from there for some reason. Is my royal money too good for you sir? Is that it? 
So since the merchant won't sell you that lust worthy blue eyes, there are two ways to get more cards. The first and most common is to win a duel. Depending on your rank you'll be given one card out of a pool of drops that shifts based on the opponent as we've discussed. The second is via the password menu on the main menu. After every duel depending on the rank, you'll be given a number of star chips. The maximum 5 for obtaining an S rank and the number decreases by 1 at every lower rank. This is the currency in Forbidden Memories and by placing the card ID of any given card into the password menu, you're able to buy one copy for a set amount of... Jesus Christ. Since that ain't happening, you might have noticed the two types of ranks you can obtain, PO and Tech. Each are determined by a point system that the game gives you no indication of, depending on what you do within a duel. Generally, the quicker you finish a duel, you'll receive a high PO rank, whilst the opposite applies for the Tech. The most common way of getting an S-Tech back then was to manipulate the AI into constantly fusing and waiting until they deck themselves out. Yes, it's as painful as it sounds, trust me. Whilst this all seems redundant, believe me, you need to take note of both types of ranks, as certain card drops are exclusive to either PO or Tech. A-Tech specifically are pretty much the only way to obtain some of the most broken cards in this game. OP are quick spells like Megamorph that only drops from A-Tech in Pegasus, or powerful spells such as Raigeki, this being damn near crucial to obtain multiple copies of each if you plan on beating the game. When I said the story of Forbidden Memories can be beaten in a few hours, I wasn't kidding. Don't let that fool you though, the sheer task of obtaining the cards you need to even have a chance is where this game truly begins. This all stems from the fact that your card drop is determined by the frame you start a duel on. You can use RNG manipulation to help you, but you need to have a deep understanding of the game, far beyond the knowledge of a first timer where it's essentially random. There is no guarantee you'll get the card you want, even if you achieve the correct ranking meaning you're forced to face the same opponent again and again until you get the specific card drop you want. But a power rank it isn't so bad, you can usually finish a duel in around 2 minutes, but those 2 minutes quickly add up if it takes you several hundred duels to finally obtain the drop you wanted. Atex on the other hand, are not for the faint of heart. Thanks to recent developments in the speedrunning community, a faster way of achieving Atex was discovered which replaced the old deck out method instantly. I'm not the best at explaining so I'll leave the link to GFC's channel below, a forbidden memory speedrunner with a record in the RNG minute category. And whilst this method is much faster, it still takes around 8-9 to nine minutes per attempt on average. However, let's put this into the perspective of a child who played this game back in the 90s when this method didn't exist to prove how ludicrous this was. Said child would have to waste 15 minutes per attempt. Now let's be generous and say on average you obtained one copy every 100 attempts. That's 1500 minutes or 25 hours. Triple that to 75 hours assuming they're aiming for three copies of any given card and you see just how batshit insane this whole ordeal becomes. It could quite possibly take you several months or at worst around a year of your life to obtain the cards you need to finish the story. This is absolutely crazy to me and I wouldn't have believed it unless I hadn't experienced this grind first hand growing up. You may find it weird that I brought up such a huge issue in a video where I'm stating everything I love about this game. I do have a reason for that as you'll discover soon enough, but also I believe that even if you love a game as much as I do with this, you can still critique the flaws as it will only make you appreciate the highlights all the more. However, since I was blessed by the king of games in health growing up, I have evolved into a jammy wanker and got Raigeki from Shade on my first A tech, but do not count on the game taking pity on you, as it still took weeks of constant grinding for me to obtain the free Mega Mars from Pegasus that I needed, even with the fast A tech method. This is the dark side of Forbidden Memories, and in hindsight, I can kinda see why this game is as obscure as it was, given the amount of shit you'll be forced to contest with. The free dual theme is a banger though, I will never get tired listening to that. So after the plebs are defeated and you obtain the 5 millennium items they protected, Seto will make his reappearance and guide you to the fast shrine's hidden secret, the Dark Shrine, where Haishin and his final mages reside. If you didn't do the Seto 2 event, you'll also have to take on the Labyrinth Ruler turning the final 6 into the final 7. The Royal Mages, Sebek and Neku are your first test, and given they betrayed the 10's parents, I'm not too thrilled about either of these toss parts. Both in some of the most powerful cards in the game, and a dark field advantage to boot, they can pose quite a problem. Unless, you maxed out on MBDs and Mega Morphs like I did, so they were a complete joke. Halfway into the final 6, you finally get another crack at Aishin. It's presented as a tense moment with the lack of music in the background, but given as a kid I wasn't expecting him to be this early, it just comes across as an awkward encounter. Anyway, whilst his deck has been beefed up a little bit with the inclusion of Gate Guardian, since the dark field doesn't give it a boost, thank fuck, we can easily defeat them with our MBD Sun Guardian start and finish Haishin off. 
and in the most shocking turn of events that almost everybody saw coming, Seto finally reveals his hand. Knowing the possession of the Millennium Rod, he explains he's a descendant of the Dark Household, who made a pact with the Card Guardian, a deity that replaces Sork in this version, and by returning the items to the Millennium Stone, they can summon him to renew the pact and take over the world, only serving Haishin as a ploy in the hopes of sealing the items. Yeah, Seto, it was pretty obvious you weren't feeling anyone. Naturally, he challenges you to a duel to retake the items, and this time he's no joke. The field is neutral, which is nice, but that hardly matters as he has three copies of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Three! We can't even obtain this card and he has three of them? Fortunately, thanks to my 5500 attack MBD and a few Raigekis, we blow this field away pretty quickly. Get bent, you bellend. With the defeat of Seto, the end of the world is prevented and they all lived happily ever after is what I would be saying if Haishin didn't come out of nowhere and reveal he knew of Settle's plan the entire time, which... Who didn't know, let's be honest. Now holding a blade to his face, Haishin commands us to give him the items in exchange for Settle's life. It's a good thing we don't care about this asshole. Oh, come on! Atem, you were willing to risk Kaiba's life in Duel's Kingdom, but you take pity on him? Aishin, now in command of the items, returns them to the Millennium Stone and achieves his goal in summoning the Card Guardian, ordering the Guardian to obey him as per the pact, only for this man to flitch afar off and use his power to turn him into a card, setting him alight in the most satisfying death scene I think I've ever witnessed in a video game. After everything Haishin has done, not just to Egypt but attempt specifically, he had it coming. I'm sorry, he had it coming. We can't celebrate just yet however, as it's clear Dark Knight has no intention of going home quietly, and with the Millennium items gone there is nothing to represent the part they have with him, until Seto points out the blank cards the Prince gave to Yuki during the tournament, still containing the present day items within. How did he even know we had them in the first place? So with the pack still intact, Dark Knight offers them a lifeline, defeat him in a duel and he will go home quietly. In all honesty, this duel can be quite tough. He doesn't have a feel advantage, thank god, but if you made it this far, you should be able to manage him. But this wouldn't be a 1998 game for the PS1 if the final boss didn't have two phases. And in the most petty display you'd never expect from a deity, Dark Knight evolves into his final form Nightmare through a temper tantrum and... He's actually way easier. Interestingly enough, whilst Dark Knight uses a combination of monster spells and traps, Nightmare's deck takes inspiration from the goat himself, Joey Wheeler, comprised with nothing but monster cards. And with that, Egypt is now saved, and Atem is crowned the rightful king. Seto ran off like a bitch and missed the final duel and was never seen again. Kind of fitting in all honesty, but regardless, this brings to a close the tale of forbidden memories. We aren't done yet though, as there is one final aspect of this game that wouldn't sit right with me if I didn't highlight and bring attention to it. That being the fantastic fan community that encapsulates this hidden gem. Through the dozens of mods that have been developed and are now available for you to download, this amazing community has not only succeeded in keeping this game alive all these years, but enhanced the experience. All of those flaws that I mentioned earlier, are you aware of the card drop mods? Free variants that increase the number of cards you earn per duel, making the monumental task of building a deck all the easier. They exist and you can even choose how many cards you earn. If you think earning 10 to 15 cards is too OP, give the 5 card mod a shot. There are even mods that increase your star chips too, making those atrocious password costs all the easier to handle. And we're only at the tip of the iceberg. Want to make the game way harder? There are mods for that. Having a way to make the unattainable cards accessible as drops? Mods for that exist too. Mods that completely overhaul the game, providing a fresh new experience with new cards, fusions and decks. My favourite in this regard being Forbidden Memories Arrange, developed by Seta Phoenix Projects, link in the description. FM Arrange includes a whole host of additional cards from modern Yu-Gi-Oh, a brand new fusion system that actually makes sense and is easy to pick up, altered drop rates making grinding a thing of the past, and my absolute favourite addition, having relevant card information on the tech itself, such as the fusion materials required to make the monster, and its card ID available to you at the press of the button within the game itself. This is seriously something I've always wanted in Forbidden Memories and should be a standard going forward. Absolutely incredible. Before I forget, meet Taya, a program that also has an online version if you are into download links, which serves as an up-to-date database for all things vanilla Forbidden Memories and every single mod, giving you access to anything you could ever want to know from opponent decks, to drop rates, fusion lists and much much more at the palm of your hands. It's down to this unbelievable community that I can confidently say I will forever love Yu-Gi-Oh Forbidden Memories. The base game has its flaws, no game is perfect after all, however thanks to the hard work that's been put in due to the passion these fans have had for the game, we are now able to experience this game in so many different ways, and in many cases better than we could have ever imagined all the way back in 1998. With that, I think I've said everything I wanted to say, I am the Introverted Crate and thank you very much for watching. Hi again. 
So, I have a Twitter if you want to interact. That's where you'll find me when I'm not replying to comments. If you enjoyed and you'd like to see more, feel free to subscribe. And if you have any feedback as to how I can improve my content going forward, please let me know. But that's all I have for now. Have a great day and take care.